This is K.M. Wyland, and you are listening to the 487th episode of the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. Along with many others in the month of November, I've been contemplating gratitude a lot lately. One thing that I am unceasingly grateful for is the fellowship of writers who listen to this podcast, read the blog, and honestly, all of those writers who don't as well. All the amazing people out there who are putting words on paper and creating stories and sharing the ideas that give me hope, insight, wonder, and excitement every day of my life. Actually, as I really pause to think about what a gift it is that you are contributing to my life by being part of that tremendous crowd of creative thinkers whose books, articles, and movies take up such a huge and important space in my life, I'm quite overcome. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the podcast, reading the blog, leaving comments and sending emails. But mostly, thank you for being a writer and keep it up. And now I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast, How to Choose the Right Antagonist for Any Type of Story. The antagonist may not be the big money reason readers pick up a book or audiences flock to a theater, but he is ultimately the reason the protagonist either A, has a reason to stop wasting her life eating potato chips on the couch, or B, doesn't just coast through every obstacle in the story with boring ease. So we gotta give our antagonists some love. For starters, this means crafting them with as much nuance and care as what we lavish on our protagonists. If you stand up an amazingly dimensional protagonist against a cardboard antagonist, it's always going to show. The antagonist is the flint to the protagonist's steel, the immovable object to the protagonist's unstoppable force, the destiny to the protagonist's free choice. Apart, they may not even be that interesting, but together, whammo, can anyone say inciting event. But it's not enough to throw a bad guy and a good guy in the ring together. It's not even enough to dream up an antagonist who just happens to be opposed to your protagonist's every move, although that is way better. It's also worth noting that giving the devil his due doesn't mean giving him the spotlight. I feel like there's an unfortunate trend these days toward overemphasizing the antagonist at the expense of the protagonist. Enemies turned anti-heroes and redemptive arcs are all fine and well, but not at the expense of narrative integrity, or for that matter, proper use of character audience identification. The only way to get your protagonist and antagonist to sing in harmony is to craft them that way from the beginning. The harmonics in any story arise out of theme. Just as your protagonist must be carefully chosen and crafted to suit your theme, or vice versa, so too your antagonist. There are many ways to approach this union of protagonist-antagonist theme, which ultimately is just another representation of that trifecta of character plot theme. One of the best ways is to take cues from your protagonist's character arc. If you know how your most important character will be thematically impacted by the events of the plot, then you will be able to holistically figure out how to craft an antagonist who both impacts and is impacted by your protagonist's changes. Now, usually I prefer the more inclusive term antagonistic force, since it doesn't assume the antagonist is human. Today, we'll be talking mostly about antagonists who are characters in their own right, so I'm mostly using the term antagonist. But don't forget the same principles apply, if only symbolically, even in stories that don't offer a personified antagonist. So before we start exploring how your protagonists and antagonists' character arcs might thematically influence each other, let's first take a look at some broad categories of antagonistic forces. Category number one, protagonist versus society. So here we have a protagonist facing off against not just an individual, but an entire society, usually one that is corrupt in some way. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which is not to be confused with H.G. Wells's book of the same title, and Suzanne Collins's The Hunger Games represent this genre. However, even in stories of this epic scope, 
it's usually best to personify the society in either a specific antagonist, such as Collins's President Snow, or at least a series of symbolic characters, as in Invisible Man. Category number two, protagonist versus nature. This would be any story in which the protagonist is trying to accomplish something, usually survival, in the face of weather, for example, a hurricane, an unforgiving setting, such as the desert, an animal, predators, an illness, for example, epidemics, or technically zombies, or anything else along those lines. These stories may also introduce a human foe, but usually in the role of contagonist rather than antagonist. More often, the protagonist's personal and thematic arc will interact with the faceless antagonistic force in a more symbolic nature, with the force of nature offering an externalization of the character's inner battle. Category number three, protagonist versus self. Very few plots are literally about the protagonist versus himself. Even in stories in which the character's internal conflict is the central focus, the conflict will also be externalized in some symbolic way. It could be the protagonist literally gets in his own way by self-destructively throwing up obstacles to his plot goal, but it could also be the struggle against self is represented on a grander scale by having it mirror a larger faceless conflict, as in protagonist versus nature or even society. And or the protagonist's inner demons are metaphorically represented by the various people he meets throughout the narrative. Category number four, protagonist versus protagonist. Most of the time when we hear protagonist and antagonist, we think good guy and bad guy. But this isn't actually accurate since these terms are meant to indicate narrative function rather than moral alignment. It's totally possible to have your protagonist be the most evil person in the story and your antagonist be the most angelic. This is most obvious in stories in which the antagonist is more of a co-protagonist. And what this really means is that each protagonist is going to be creating the obstacles to the other's plot goals. These stories are often great for exploring morally complicated themes. They're also customary in romances, in which the central conflict is relational, with both characters being equally important in the climactic decision to be, or not to be, together. And category number five, protagonist versus antagonist. So finally, we have the classic setup of protagonist versus antagonist. In this type of narrative, the protagonist represents the structural through line. And as such, the character with whom audiences are intended to identify. The antagonist is the person who stands in opposition to the protagonist after their goals turn out to be mutually exclusive. Almost always, the antagonist's goals will predate the protagonist's. The protagonist is the one who, for whatever reason, decides she must react to the antagonist, either to stop the antagonist from doing something, or because the antagonist is the one trying to stop her. Okay, so I've talked before about how you can view your entire plot as essentially one big thematic metaphor. But this only works if the antagonist is properly aligned within the theme as well as the plot. On a really abstract and zoomed out level, you can think of your antagonist as the plot because he creates the obstacles to the protagonist's plot goals he is what creates the conflict, and the conflict is the plot. What this means when we zoom back in is that your antagonist's motives and actions must not just directly impact your protagonist in the plot, they must also impact your protagonist in the theme. Specifically, you want the antagonist to present a direct challenge to your protagonist's thematic orientation. If your protagonist represents or will come to represent the thematic truth, then your antagonist should be the thematic avatar of the lie, and vice versa. No one in the story should have a greater impact on your protagonist's evolution from lie to truth, or truth to lie, than does your antagonist. This doesn't mean the antagonist needs to sit down with the protagonist for an ideological or existential debate. It doesn't even mean the two need to ever be physically present in the same room. But it does mean the protagonist's character arc 
is catalyzed by the obstacles presented by the antagonist in the external plot. Although there are myriad variations of character arc your protagonist might undertake in your story, we can group those variations within three broad categories. These categories, in turn, will offer guidance about what role your antagonist should play in both your story's plot and particularly its theme. Category number one, if your protagonist is following a positive change arc. So in a positive change arc story, the protagonist will start out in a negative relationship to the thematic truth. This means he will begin the story by resisting or outright rejecting the truth in favor of an opposing lie. As a direct result of the events created by the main conflict, the protagonist will be forced to confront the limitations of this lie and start moving into an understanding and embrace of the truth. Now, in response, the antagonist may take one of two thematic stances. The first possibility will begin with an antagonist who also believes and represents the lie. It may be exactly the same lie the protagonist starts out with, or it may be a bigger version of the lie to which the protagonist is initially attracted. Because of their similar alignment with the lie, it may be the protagonist and antagonist start out on the same side of the conflict. Even if they represent differing goals, the protagonist will still be attracted to and feel an affinity to the antagonist. Since, at least in their belief in the lie, they are alike. However, unlike the protagonist, who begins to see through the lie in favor of the truth, the antagonist will not change. By the story's end, he will come to represent the full consequences of following the lie and will probably be overcome by the protagonist's new truth. Now, the second possibility here offers an antagonist who aligns with the truth, opposes the protagonist's lie from the beginning, and eventually, quote unquote, breaks the protagonist with the truth as a way of helping her recognize that the lie is unsustainable. This type of antagonist is less likely to be morally evil or ambiguous. Often this type of antagonist is an important relationship character, such as the love interest in a romance. In order for the protagonist to be with the antagonist, the protagonist must overcome her destructive lie-based mindset. Category number two, if your protagonist is following a flat arc. In a flat arc story, the protagonist does not change his primary thematic viewpoint. Thematically, he represents the truth, or less often and always tragically, the lie. Because of his own powerful alignment to the theme, he will inspire change in other important characters by the end of the story. He will use his alignment with the theme to advance his plot goals. Stories such as this, in which the protagonist does not personally change, usually present the thematic argument via opposing ideologies. As such, the antagonist will usually be equally resilient in representing the opposite side of the argument, the lie, if the protagonist represents the truth, or vice versa. In these stories, it is possible for the antagonist to undergo a change arc, either positive or negative, as a result of interacting with the protagonist. However, this can sometimes put the antagonist in a role of comparative weakness next to an immovable protagonist. A more powerful thematic argument, and thus story, usually arises when the antagonist is designed to represent the opposite and equally forceful side of the theme. And category number three. If your protagonist is following a negative change arc, Negative change arcs offer more variation. The protagonist may start out in either a positive or negative relationship with the thematic truth. As in a positive arc story, she may start out already believing the lie, in which case she will either arc into believing a disillusioning truth or devolve into an even darker version of the lie. She may also start out believing in the truth only to fall away into a lie. In these types of story, the antagonist may steadfastly represent the truth 
which will be futilely pitted against the protagonist's lie in a battle of ideologies, or he will represent the lie and serve to seduce the protagonist to her ultimate demise. Both in creating plot and in creating theme, your two most important characters will always be your protagonist and your antagonist. By consciously crafting an antagonist whose plot actions are motivated by a thematically appropriate relationship to the story's positive truth and lie, you will all but guarantee a solid narrative. More than that, if you're willing to deepen your understanding of your antagonist's relationship to the theme, you can add even more nuance by mirroring your protagonist's character arc with an equally powerful arc from a different perspective. So tell me your opinion about this. How do you choose the right antagonist for your story? If you'd like to be part of the word player community over on my site and join in the conversation on this subject, be sure to stop by the website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. You can always find a transcript of the most recent podcast and add your voice to the discussion by visiting the first post on the site's homepage. And if you're looking for an older post, you can always find those by putting the podcast title in the search field at the top of the right-hand column. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe on Apple Podcast. And if you'd like to support helping writers become authors, I would totally appreciate it if you'd consider taking the time to leave a quick rating or review on the Apple site. Thanks so much for listening to the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast, and be sure to check back again next week.